how does drilling and other types of oil and gas activity impact the value of your mineral rights? Today, we're talking about the types of activity that can make you the next shellionaire. So stay tuned and learn something. Howdy folks, my name is Stephen Hatcher and I'm the creator of Minerals Guy. In series three, we're talking about when your mineral rights are most valuable and how timing can drive their value. And whether you're thinking about selling, you're on the fence, or you just wanna understand more about the value of your mineral rights, timing has an enormous impact on their value. And here is what I tell folks to think about. High prices plus high activity equals high value. Price and activity are by far the two most important components of mineral valuation. And if you have both of these things at the same time, then your minerals could be very valuable. In episode one of this series, we talked about what it means for prices to be high. So go check out that episode when you get a little bit of time. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about what it means for activity to be high and the types of activity for you to look for. So let's jump into high activity. Okay, folks, so before we jump into the types of activity to look for, the first thing that you need to think about is where is this oil and gas activity being conducted in relation to your tract of land? And it goes without saying that activity that's located, you know, two miles away from your tract is going to be more meaningful than activity that's located 20 miles away from your tract. And activity that's located on your tract or a pooled tract is going to be most meaningful in terms of mineral valuation. So let's jump into what it means for tracks to be pooled. So what do we mean by pooling? Well, a well doesn't necessarily have to be located on your tract of land in order for you to participate for a share of production. And pooling is a process whereby oil and gas companies will designate multiple tracks for participation in an oil and gas well. So why do the companies do this in the first place? They do this because the law requires them to. Every oil and gas jurisdiction is going to have laws and regulations that govern where wells can be drilled, the number of acres that needed to be included for participation in that well, and the number of wells that can be drilled in that given area. So rules of compulsory pooling were really developed for two primary reasons. The first is to prevent too many wells from being drilled in a given area, right? Which can actually damage the oil and gas reservoir and cause less recovery for all parties. And the second is to make sure that each mineral owner is entitled to their just and equitable share of production. Now, when tracks are pooled together, we call those pooled tracks a drilling spacing unit or unit, which is probably a term that you've heard before. Now, historically, drilling spacing units for horizontal wells and using the public land survey system or the section township range system have consisted of 640 acres or one section. So if you own an interest in that 640 acre section, then you would participate for a share of production. Now, as technology has advanced and as companies have begun to drill longer and longer laterals, some extending two and even three miles, it is not uncommon for drilling spacing units to comprise two sections or 1,280 acres or even three sections, which is 1,920 acres. And so if you own a tract within that larger pooled unit, then you would participate for a share of production. So if you're driving down the road and you see a drilling rig within two to three miles from your home, there's a good chance that you could be included in that drilling spacing unit and participate in the production from that well being drilled. And really what this tells you is that you need to understand where your tract is in relation to the activity. Now, a lot of states have free GIS mapping software that anybody can use, right? And, and you can use this mapping software to understand where your tract is in relation to oil and gas activity in your area. 
And if you guys want me to do a video on how to use this software in order to see oil and gas activity, leave me a comment down below. Okay, folks, so let's jump into the types of activity to look for. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think about the types of activity as a scale or a spectrum, right? And as we move farther down the scale, right, to a producing well, your minerals are going to become more and more valuable. Okay, folks, so the first step on the activity spectrum is leasing. So a landman shows up on your doorstep and asks to buy a lease. This is a very good sign. And now the oil and gas lease is the contract between the mineral owner and the oil and gas operator that allows the operator to drill wells in order to extract the minerals located in the ground. Now, as compensation for granting this lease, right, you're going to be entitled to a lease bonus, which is a signing bonus granted upon execution of the lease, and a lease royalty, which is going to entitle you to a share of production. Now, the next type of activity to look for is pre-permit and permit activity, right? So these, this is when the oil and gas operator, right, seeks regulatory approval to go in and drill the wells. And pre-permitting activity typically looks like the operators establishing the drilling spacing units, right, where the wells will be drilled. Perhaps they, they establish the pattern of development and show how many wells they believe they can drill into the reservoir. Now, pre-permit activity could happen a year or more before a drilling rig ever moves in to drill the well. Now, permit activity typically happens a little bit closer to the actual drilling of the well. And this is the oil and gas company seeking regulatory approval to actually move the drilling rig in and drill the well. So the next type of activity is the actual drilling and completion of the wells. And I'm gonna break this into three parts, right? So the first part is really pre-drilling activity, right? So land clearing, building a drill site, building roads, digging ponds, and all of the, the, the land construction work that needs to be done before the drilling rig can actually be moved into the location, right? So once the land is ready, the drill site is prepped, the drilling rig will be moved onto the location um, in, on multiple 18-wheelers, the derrick will be stood up, and actual drilling operations will commence at that point, right? So the actual drilling of the well could take anywhere between five and 30 days, right? Depending on where you are in the country, depending on the formation that is being drilled, right? So once the well is drilled to total depth or TD, the drilling rig will rig down, you know, any logs will, will be run that need to be run and the drilling rig will actually move to the next location. So once drilling is complete, the drilling rig will be torn down and it will be moved off site. And what the oil and gas company has at that point is what's called a drilled but uncompleted well or a duck or DUC. And a completion crew will have to return, right, in order to complete that well and frack it, right, before it can produce oil and natural gas. And now it can take sometimes between three to six months before that completion crew returns to the location to actually frack that well. So the final type of activity is actual production, right? So after the well has been fracked, it's turned over to production and it actually starts to produce oil and natural gas, right? So this is when your reserves as a mineral owner in the ground are converted from undeveloped to developed and your cash flow stream actually begins. And this is when your minerals become much more valuable. Okay, folks, so now that we've talked about the types of activity to look for, Let's go back to the top of the funnel and talk about why activity matters in the first place, right? And what I tell folks is that risk of development is a critical factor for the value of your mineral rights. And this is similar to the time value of money concept, right? So minerals that are developed today are worth more than minerals developed tomorrow or 10 years from now and minerals that never get developed have zero value. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about reserve valuations being conducted by petroleum engineers, 
or offers being made by mineral buyers, properties that have line of sight to development are going to be worth more. So as we get further down this scale of activity, your minerals become more and more valuable because line of sight to production and cash flow becomes more established. So if you receive a pre-permit application in the mail, while this is a good thing, this is one of the types of activity to look for, right? It could still be several years before a well is ever drilled and before you ever receive a royalty check. And what this means is that the risk of development is still relatively high, right? But as we get further down the scale of activity, and we're talking about permitting activity, we're talking about drilling and fracking activity, your minerals become substantially more valuable. So when are your minerals most valuable from an activity perspective? Said another way, when is the best time to exit in order to achieve maximal value? I would argue that your mineral rights are most valuable in the months following first production from a new well or wells. And I have two reasons for this. The first is that the reserves that you own in the ground have been converted from undeveloped to developed, right? Meaning that the risk of development is zero, right? Line of sight has been determined and more value is going to be attributed to your properties for that reason. The second is that this is when volume is highest. Now, we're going to cover the concept of depletion or decline in an oil and gas well in another episode. But in general, what you should understand is that oil and gas wells produce more volume earlier in their life than they do later in their life. And a good rule of thumb for a shale well is that it will recover 70 to 80% of its total volume within the first two years of production. So in the first few months following production from a new well, this is when your royalty checks are gonna be the highest because the volume being produced from your well is highest. So in a perfect world, you would wait until your minerals are producing before you consider selling or exiting, but we don't live in a perfect world. And sometimes the best time to consider selling is when you receive a fair offer for your minerals and that could be prior to production. The offer will be lower, but in that case, you're also shifting the risk of development over to the buyer. So what happens if prices crash, right? What happens if it takes the operator five years to drill that well? Or what if the well never gets drilled at all? The question is, what is that risk worth to you? And remember that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow or five years from now. As a mineral and royalty owner, what do you do with this information, right? So going back to the top of the funnel, in this series, we're talking about when your mineral rights are most valuable. Today, we talked about activity and how activity drives value. But remember that activity is not the only component of mineral valuation. So go back and watch episode one where we talked about what it means for prices to be high. And we hope you'll join us for episode three where we're gonna talk about the interdependence of price and activity and how timing is everything. As always, if you enjoyed our content today, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. If you have any questions for us, you can reach us in the comments below. You can also find us on our website, mineralsguide.com, or you can reach me by email, steven at mineralsguide.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.